Ben Carpenter. Welcome back on the podcast. Third Thank episode. Thank you very much. Thank you for having me again. Mate, it's um, it's a little bit shit that we're not sat there. We've done a couple face to face, but when you sent me a message going, I will fly from LA to come do the podcast. I was like, it's, we we can just sit down and do it online. It's okay. But thank you for the offer. I think I just think it's nice to be a, a generous guest. And I thought, you know, 15 hours on the flight, if it means we get a good podcast and it's better for everyone else, I feel like I should offer. It's a pretty insane distance to come, but I do, I do appreciate it. How is LA at the moment? Because from everything I hear, it's full of homeless people. Uh, yeah, Los Angeles itself is um, not the romantic city that it looks on Hollywood films. Um, some parts of California in general, really beautiful. Weather is amazing. Uh, LA itself is not always a very pleasant city, depending on where you are. The type of place that you wouldn't want your wife to walk alone at night, is fair to say. I uh, was there a few years ago, and I remember going to downtown LA, and I was like, oh, I've seen this skyline in Grand Theft Auto. Went there on an electric scooter, got there, and I was like, get me out of here. Yeah, it's uh, it's one of those places. Um, a friend of mine said it's like a thin veneer of wealth uh, kind of coinciding with poverty. You can be you can be on a street where there are supercars. I, I've been in a gym where the car park was full of like... Um, supercars lamborghinis ferraris etc and then literally five yards away there's a row of homeless tents it's a very very odd dichotomy another thing that's changed with the whole australia america where we're living is our visa situation since we last spoke we both said that we were like planes that couldn't land so congratulations ben carpenter you do i call you an american resident or a green card holder uh, you can call me an American resident. I'm a lawful permanent resident for two years. But also, congratulations to you. Now you're allowed to live in Australia. A lot has changed since podcast one and two. Yeah, yeah. I'll probably say the word cunt a lot less, uh, to be honest, growing up a little bit. But is that a management a thing? <laughs> That's a yeah. legal thing. Isn't it such a relief? It, I've come to realise, tell me if this was the same for you, and we'll get onto the mm-hmm. book in a second. There's so many markers that I thought I'd celebrate. But then when I accomplish them, I feel a sense of relief, not happiness. I feel like that's a, it feels like that's a conversation for the therapist. And I know, I do know what you mean. Uh, yeah, I think, I think sometimes like the checkoff list and you're like, I want to do this, I want to do this, I want to do this. Sometimes it's the relief of finishing a massive task rather than like excitement that you've done it, especially when it's been weighing on your shoulders for a long time, like where you want to live. That's a huge burden to finally release. You won't know this better than me. I believe it has something to do with dopamine and serotonin. Where I think maybe dopamine is what you get as you're chasing and serotonin is what you get when you accomplish. I can't remember. I, I, don't I, I actually remember on our last podcast, you talked to me about the difference between uh, pleasure and happiness. And you were talking about celebrating mini goals. So did you feel happiness when you got your permanent residency in Australia? Did you celebrate or did you move on to the next thing? Uh, it was my mum's birthday, so I didn't want to steal the thunder. <laughs> so, yeah, I, I, I woke up and imagine this for like four years. I put the formal application in uh, about two years ago. So every day after I put that last application in, I'd swipe my screen in the morning, just check my emails. Yeah. And then the one morning it was there, I was like, nah. I was like, I'm not even telling anyone. I went into my dad's study and I printed it out so it was real. So I could hold it in front of me and be like, "Yeah, dad, what does this say? And he's like, oh, congratulations. I was like, oh my God. Uh, yeah, it was it was a relief, but it, just to know that I could come somewhere and not have to worry about leaving. You, you your days were numbered in America a lot. You had to travel like a lot. Yeah, I had I had ninety days maximum, and I did exactly the same thing you did, where every single morning you refreshed the website or to see if you had been granted. And I actually, with my visa process, I knew that I would get an email every time there was like a change in the visa process. Um, and even though I get almost an instant email every time there was a change, I was refreshing the web page so frequently that I saw there had been a change to my application before I'd even received the email. And when it said there's been a change on your application, I was like logged straight in. And uh, it's like, oh yeah, you're, you have been accepted. Um, it, it was really quick in the end. It only took a few weeks. Uh, apparently, according to my attorneys, because I'm white and English, they're like, in America, they're more likely to wave you through. If you were from some countries, it could have taken over a year. But for me, they're like, yeah, come on in. 
We trust you. Only in Dubai, people kick off if their visa takes more than two weeks. This uh, so my visa process on the official website it said it could take, I think on average at the time it was fifteen to twenty five months, and I think from the time I actually applied for it, uh, it, it was it was like I think it was a few weeks, really quick, surprisingly quick. Incredible, incredible stuff. It's, does it still take you a couple hours to get through immigration? Uh, funny story. Uh, last time it took me four hours because <laughs> when I when I landed in LAX, I didn't realise I had to hold my permanent green card, my physical green card. I thought it was one of those things that linked with your passport. So when you land, they're like, oh, they can see he's a resident. Like when you land in England, you don't have to show you show your passport, and it's all lit. It's uh, your resident status is kind of assumed. I thought it was linked with my passport, so I scanned it, and they said, um, "Are you a?" green card holder and i said i'm a lawful permanent resident and they said oh can we see your green card and i showed them the photo thinking they just needed the number to like put it in the system or whatever and they said oh yeah you're gonna have to go into the secondary interview so i sat in a holding room for something like three or four hours with a lot of people that were sweating a lot and then they ended up calling me to the front and said why don't you have your card and i was like i didn't realize i needed it it's in my uh, bedside table and they said all right don't do that next time and that was it Hey, the, that's the one thing about America I can't stand. It's that them queues. I um I went to LAX when I went to Coachella in 2019, and yeah. some of the people I was going with flew from Australia to Canada, and I was like, "Why are you going to Canada to get a connecting flight to come back to LA?" And they said, "Oh, it'd be quicker. We'll fly an hour further, then the connecting flight back is an hour, and it will be quicker because we'll get to go through the customs in Canada." And they beat me to uh, beat me to the hotel. And yeah, it's just insane. So every time everyone's like, oh, you should come to the States. Although 14, 15 hour flight, fine. Two hours to get through passport security. I can justify the flight because I understand the distance. But to be able to get across a border in that time, it just kills me. Anyway. Yeah, especially because uh, every time I queued, I wasn't sure if they would let me in. So it's always a stressful queue. You always have yeah. those nerves. So in front of me, uh, this is actually the copy you sent me of your new book everything fat loss i'm holding it so close to the camera because i'm just reading you know my little blurb on the back thanks it was you that sent me the second copy because it said big man smith's on it that was the word yeah that was the word uh, alfie my dog actually chewed the cover to the first copy but uh, <laughs> what was it like eventually getting the book out similar um, to the thing you know what exactly like that exactly like that as as you know better than most people i'm a very anxious person and i stress a lot and i'm also a very perfectionist so um it took me three years to write it like part-time writing it keeping up social media content etc but when it was finally released i didn't feel excitement being honest it was a, a sense of relief it was so much stress and anxiety off my shoulders that it was finally done and put into the world and then that anxiety and stress switched for a different anxiety and stress of like making sure that people were enjoying the book and making sure all the um, links worked for when people clicked on it to buy it from their certain country or whatever. And I never really celebrated. And an element of dread as well, in case you got something wrong or you misinterpreted the data or that all those people that you worry that are waiting to cancel you all come together at once and have been waiting you, for this very moment to leave you a hundred bad book reviews. You know what I th you know what I think, right? I think when you're a smaller creator on social media, sometimes just publishing a post can be nerve wracking because you feel like people are going to um, get angry at you or try and correct you or nitpick your post or whatever. And obviously, you are such a big creator now. You probably don't feel that. You just post, move on to the next one, post, move on to the next one. But this this was a huge sense of that for me, where it's out into the world and it's such a big project. It's not like a social media post that you can delete or go back and edit if you get something slightly wrong. It's there for the world, for all to see. And by the time anyone sees a mistake, hundreds or thousands of copies are out into the world and everyone can see that mistake. I can't go back and edit it for those people that you can a social media caption. And that that comes with its own level of stress. I spent, I probably spent maybe five hours proofreading a book an extra time and all I found were misplaced hyphens. That's the level of detail it went into it at the end. I get to a point where after the writing process, I can't look at it. You know, my most recent book, I've never read. I've never skimmed through the pages. I've never listened to the audiobook. Like, 
I, when I got to a point it was finished, that's one of the beautiful things for having an editor. I was like, I think I'm done. And I was like, you tell me it's done. She was like, it's done. I was like, thanks. Like, uh, it's like rearing a child into the world. Yeah. It's, um, it's almost like, you know, the saying, you have to kick the bird out the nest and see if it flies or not. That's, that's kind of what it is. You can't, you can't take it back. You have to see what happens. I had one friend that sent me a message and said, you've repeated one word. You know, you shouldn't repeat words in quick succession. He's like, you've repeated one word in quite quick succession in the like acknowledgement section. And I literally said, fuck off. Yeah. I was like, I am is- all, I'm all for making corrections and I'm all for making sure that everything's smooth. But that wasn't even a correction. It's just something that isn't grammatically brilliant. And I was like, I don't care about that. Get out of my inbox. Send it to me in a month. The most important thing is that something works. So for me, right, there were two questions I asked myself, and this might put your mind at ease. So when you're selling the book, you sometimes have to say to someone, okay, is that person getting the value for money? And when you look at the hours that you put in, the effort that you put in and the lessons that are there, sometimes I look at one chapter, which I can do in yours very easily, and be like, cool, this fucking chapter is worth the money, this chapter alone. And when I know that just four pages could influence someone's life to the better and it will cost them $10, $20, whatever, I'm like, and you get everything else. That's how I felt about it. I was like, do you know what? Because you get this, this like existential, what am I doing? Why am I selling the book? All of this. And then you're like, do you know what? There's, there's five lessons in there that are all worth the cost of the book alone. And then that puts your mind to ease. And if there is a spelling mistake, if I was to give that to 100 people, would 99 understand what I was saying? And yeah. There's, I believe there's a saying that says, if you wait until you're ready to do something, you started too late. Yeah, I think there's also, as you are very well aware, there's also kind of a return on investment when it comes to perfectionism, where something can be good enough and you can be like, this is great value for money in the book. And you could spend many extra hours tweaking it, looking for grammatical mistakes. But ultimately, does it change the... Uh, message and information and value that people take from it probably not and I think for me it's very important to try and escape that perfectionist nature and get to the point where like this is good enough I don't need to spend hours looking for misplaced hyphens and commas and stuff there was a bit of I saw the skullduggery that you were having to experience with Amazon and having to communicate with people how Amazon works so for people listening Amazon are ruthless right yeah. they're ruthless to the point that they they actually do some machiavellian shit so a friend of mine actually you know as well sells a protein bar and amazon were like we want to buy these protein bars at this and sell them at this so the protein bar company were like nah that's a shit deal we're not doing it so they said okay we're going to take your competitor and we're going to sell their bars instead at a loss we're happy to lose money to put your competitor in front of you and we will lose 50p a bar we don't give a shit now do you want to take the deal that's how Amazon work. And Amazon are happy to bleed money on a book just to have market share. So you sell a book, and I know you did. A lot of people paid the full price. Then when it's got a price cut, two things. One, people think it's you. And then they're mm-hmm. like, oh, why have you discounted it now? I was there pre-ordering or whatever. There's a price uh, promise for people that pre-order, so they pay the lowest rate. Um, but then the third thing is that people don't appreciate that a book being reduced is a sign of it performing well that the more people that order a book, the more the market share that Amazon want. So I saw you were doing your PR stuff. You're like, guys, it wasn't me. I'm sorry about the discount. How did that make you feel? Um, I, d- I honestly didn't feel good about that. So I, yeah, I, I, I for the first, as you can imagine, for the first seven days or whatever, I said, I'll put it on a slight discount. Um, and then after seven days, I'll put it up. Not a huge amount, say 10%. And just after the seven days as i was about to put the price up someone sent me a message saying oh amazon have it discounted by 10 percent," and i was like that, that doesn't make sense and i went to the website thinking there was they were looking at something wrong and i was like blow me down with a feather that is exactly what's happened they're 10 percent off and i sent out an email to everyone and i was like look i just need you to know that i have not done this i haven't said all oh, the price is going up and then i've pulled some marketing stunt and reduced the price a little bit more um and i even called amazon and said books on sale i didn't put it on sale can you at least tell me like how long you think it might be on sale and the amazon customer service rep was very friendly and she said i can't tell you it's basically worked out by algorithms it's automatically when products do well they'll go on discount sometimes they'll come off discount 
is not a conscious decision that anyone has made. And I hated the optics of it that people might have thought I manually discounted it after I said the price was going up. And the same thing's happened in England. So it's gone 10 cents off in America, 15 cents off in England. I'm not responsible for either of those. And I've been very apologetic to people in case they thought it was me. It's a, it's a crazy world out there with the Amazon stuff. Uh, after we experienced this when I did the first book. So the second two books, we had assets ready to go. So if I woke up, I would have a WhatsApp saying you've had a price drop. I would have the images that say 499 with the graphics ready to go so we could post it to captivate. Because if the algorithm's discounting it to try and push your book to the front, if we can mm. send more traffic, we can come up on like the recommended feeds. And it's like social media. You're trying to play the game, the algorithm, everything like that. But Amazon, they're greedy bastards. You're like, you go to Waterstones and you could do WH Smith. And these bookstores, I feel really bad because Waterstones are always very um, accompanying. They're like, hey, you want to do a book signing? We'll put some signs out outside the front. They'll give you a cup of coffee and a nice little signing table. They really look after you. Yeah. And you go to this book signs and they're really nice. But then you look at it and you go, this is archaic and probably there's only a limited amount of time before Amazon wins because Amazon are not, not evil, Machiavellian shit, but they are consuming everything. And even when I was in the UK, oh, I need a pint of milk. I'll go get it later. What? I can buy it on Amazon? It'll be here in two hours? Suddenly, we need to realize that how crazy it is. And our kids in the future are going to go, Dad, you used to go to a store to buy a book when someone could have brought it to your house and put it in your hand. It's, it's kind of scary the world, where the world's going. One of the things that's wild about them is, is they are such a big and powerful company that um, people have messaged me and said, I don't really like Amazon, can I buy it elsewhere? And the thing with Amazon is, this is a print-on-demand book, whereas you had thousands pre-ordered, etc., and then you do a print run, you do signing. Every time, time someone buys a book, it's printed and then shipped to them. And people were sending me confirmation saying, oh, I ordered your book and it's coming in 48 hours. And they're printing it and getting it into the hands of people in 48 hours is just wild when you think of how bookshops tended to be in the past. There are printers, then it goes to distributors, goes to bookshops, people go and walk in. It's just convenience wins. Convenience will win. And in the same way, when I was a kid, my family, I remember, like in our local town, there'll be things like a green grocers selling vegetables or people going to the market and buying vegetables. Then they go to the butcher and buy meat or whatever. Then over time, people start buying all of that stuff from a supermarket because it's convenience. And then over time, people buy all of that stuff online. They do online shopping because it's convenience. And sooner or later, it will just move to the next phase, like you say, and people buy it on Amazon. Or Amazon Fresh, where you walk into a store, it scans as soon as you put it in your cart and you basically walk out. There's no checkout process. That's the it's, next uh, one. Or pay with your palm. Up. Have you seen that? You hover your palm over, it scans your palm, and it pays. They've got that now. You know, in uh, in Sydney, we, there's a company here that deliver any groceries you want in 10 minutes. So you put your order in, you pay on the app, and it's literally your door in 10 minutes. It now takes a little bit longer, because I think they're trying to make it profitable. I was yeah. like, how can this be profitable for a cyclist to bring me my order in 10 minutes? But then I thought... You no longer need to rent the store. You no, no longer need to have someone to do the stock in the shelves and the aisles. And I was like, actually, you could take that very expensive commercial store that you have somewhere, take that money and just buy employees and give them electric bikes. I was like, wow, you're just bypassing the system. So me, if I needed, say I'm looking at my nails, I'm like, I need a nail clipper or I need a AA battery or I need yeah. some toothpaste. I'm like, I'm not wasting 15 minutes of my day. I'll get someone to drop it here while I'm cooking. Oh, I forgot carrots. Don't worry, I'll just do it. And that to me is kind of scary the way the world's going. If you look at like the speed of it, that so many of these kind of technological booms that are occurring are happening right under us. We don't even think about it. This is, all these are great examples of why over the last few decades, people's need has gone down over time because people want convenience. And when convenient options are available, People don't want to go to the effort that they used to do. So if you wanted to go and do a food shop before, you would drive to the store. Well, you'd walk to the store, get your bags, and you'd walk back. And then over time, you drive to the store because cars are more popular. Then over time, you go online, and then you do a few clicks, and it's delivered to you. Then over time, Amazon come in and say, actually, we can do all of that with less clicks or fewer clicks. And we just have to exert slightly less effort over time. People don't wash dishes by hand anymore they have dishwashers 
people don't need to do loads of things around the house because they have technology that's improving you don't have to drive or travel out of the house like you used to because everyone brings stuff to you and i think this is a great example of why we move less than we did 50 years ago and i don't really see where it stops because if someone can make your life more convenient you don't have to walk to buy your nail clippers anymore because some cyclist will bring it to you and then over time that will be a little robot that does deliveries because i've seen that rolling out as well you don't go back to the store to buy nail clippers anymore the robot will bring it to you and you only have to lie on your sofa and press a few buttons that... or your 3d printer will print it at home yeah well yeah that that at some point yeah it's good to be bringing the topic onto things to do with fat loss because in essence both trainers both talking about amazon and using like uh, <laughs> trying to talk about the world in the future it's interesting you say that about neat in one of my last live shows i had this kind of segment where i was like people think we're fat because of genetics and i'm happy to have this discussion with you and i know you've touched on this in, in mm-hmm. the book from a genetic standpoint i think we're all fucked because we've evolved for hundreds of thousands of years with food being scarce if people think that's just going to switch around in any any point in time i think they're very naive so for the for the first point rather than people going on oh, I'm, I'm genetically big boned or anything like that i think that instead we need to realize that we're all human beings that are going to have very big emotional reactions around food but second of all like you say about reducing movement friday night fish and chips as a kid i was like if you wanted to be a fat bastard back then you'd have to right yeah going down fish and chip shop anyone want anything get in there put the order in and then when you've got the battered sausages and the chips everything in front of you you're going to order more because you can smell it you can taste it you're salivating there's none of that rational ordering you know when you go past a bakery you suddenly that's hundreds of thousands of years of evolution that know hyper hedonic calorie dense foods and you're like chuck a battered sausage in there and then you try getting a chip out the bag right and i joke around at this in the live show saying that paper they used to wrap up chips should be insulating homes insulate britain should be getting that paper and wrapping it on walls because i've never seen anything hold heat in and they always do the the 69 on it the the soissant nerf and then you kind of go in the top layer and you wrap around. And I joked in the show saying it was like fingering a bird on the dance floor in Gloucester to get a chip out. And then when you get a chip out, you're burning yourself. You're burning calories even walking around the shop going, oh, you're busted, it's fucking hot. And then you make your way home with a burnt tongue and ulcers on the roof of your mouth. And like nowadays, I don't have to even move, right? You, I could be a paraplegic and I could be there on my iPhone. I could just look at my friend and use my eyes to signal that I'll buy his dinner if he goes to meet the driver. I'm not sure if there was a question in there somewhere, but I just love the the monologue of talking about the sausage and chips. Yeah, the so I think the like the easiest way to describe it is when people talk about um, like the causes of obesity is it's not necessarily do genetics cause it. It's more like the interplay between genetics and biology and environmental factors, because like you say, food is becoming more available it's becoming more convenient it's becoming tastier it's becoming more high calorie so as an example uh if you go back let's say 20 years or whatever if you were feeling peckish at home when you were a kid if you were feeling peckish at home what options did you have available to you and over time the options that are available to us now have changed so we have more high calorie high sugar high fat combination foods they are more tasty they are more hyper palatable than ever they are more convenient to buy than ever because when you go down a supermarket now the number of chocolate bars the number of cakes the number of muffins the number of everything that's like fucking delicious is significantly more than it used to be and it's easier to eat those foods than ever and when it's easier to eat those foods than ever it becomes harder and harder for the individual to resist with their willpower so if you went back let's say when you were a kid when you're talking about if you wanted sausage and chips you'd have to walk and get it yourself if you go back say 50 years and you wanted to consume more food what would your options be you'd have the pantry i used to eat dog biscuits when my mum wouldn't give me any snacks as a kid and that was my way one i enjoyed the dog biscuit but two yeah my mum was thinking I was starved. Even though I was a fat kid, I was like, oh, he's eating dog biscuits. He must be hungry. Uh, but no, you're, you're completely right. Also, another thing that I just thought of, think about the way in which we deal with transactions. So 
when people have a credit card, I think they spend like 15 to 20 percent more than they would with a debit card because with a credit card, it feels free. And actually, just paying with any kind of FPOS, contactless, tapping your card, I think removes the emotional connection from spending money. Not only that, but then imagine back in the day 50 years ago when people would have been given an, a budget to go shopping. Here's two pound, go to the shop. Don't know why they're all northern. Get yourself some lunch. And they get there and they go, I've got to make two pound go round. I'm not going to be yeah. able to overspend because there's an emotional thing when you do get to the shops and you're like, oh, I'll get this. Oh, I'll get dessert. And you walk past the aisles and everything, even the shelf height, heights of all these different foods is planned. I once used to see a girl and she had a very wealthy client and he, uh, I think he was, he owned a company called Allied Bakeries and they had like a war, but some type of bread, I can't remember. And I met him once and he was really stressed and he goes, oh, we're getting fucked. I said, what do you mean? They go, if we don't pay a lucrative amount of money, they're going to move our bread down two shelves in Tesco's. And I was like, and he was like, that will impact us way beyond the money they're trying to extort out of us. And I was like, we're, we're literally in a social experiment when we're going to these shops, the colors, the palatability, the smells. And then another friend of mine worked for a company uh, where they did smells in air conditioning to entice you. So I'm pretty sure uh, they did one for Hershey's in America, the chocolate store, where he goes, have you ever realized that when you walk into a chocolate store, you can smell it even though everything's wrapped and air sealed tight? And I was like, whoa. And even an air conditioning system that were to infuse smells into the air might cost X. But if that's going to cause people to have an emotional connection to buy more food, it's a cost productive thing that they would do. Yeah, this is a great uh, a great conversation between individual willpower and how the environment impacts their individual willpower and also how the environment can make it harder from a personal responsibility standpoint. So as an example of this, there's a research study where they positioned drinks on different parts of the shelves. So for example, they would make water more convenient and then they would make sugary sodas, sugary drinks, now I'm in America, I say soda, sugary sodas, less convenient just by moving it from, say, eye height. And when they did this two-phase experiment, when they made the water more convenient, the sales of water in that cafeteria went up and sales of sugary sodas went down. And all they had done is repositioned it so it was more convenient from eye level and also more convenient from a proximity perspective. So people, you know how you tend to grab something when you're going to the till, you're like, oh, that's right here. I'll just grab that. That looks tasty. By making it harder for people to pick those sugary drinks, they could influence the behaviors of those individuals. And the same thing has happened, um, for example, when ordering from a fast food menu. There was one experiment where they put um, higher calorie options on a second menu in an envelope. So rather than seeing it and going, oh, yeah, I want this high calorie food. It was on a second menu in an envelope, so you have to go to the effort of opening up the second one. And just that was enough to influence people's purchasing habits. So this is one of those conversations where when someone is, let's say someone's struggling with their weight, it's very easy to blame the individual. But I think sometimes you need to step back and think about the other things that are impacting that individual. Because if obesity rates have been going up, it's kind of hard to point the blame on every single person when it's becoming such a big trend. So this is one of the examples why governments um, might step in and do things like sugar taxes, because they're like, you're making food manufacturers are making foods tastier, higher calorie, sugary sodas, for example. And they're like, maybe we actually need to intervene because obesity rates, non-communicable disease rates are going up so much maybe they have to step in and try and influence the choices that we have available. So if you go into a shop and the only thing that's available are unprocessed, nutrient-dense foods, you're going to buy your lunch from that selection. But when you go in and you see a salad there and it's seven pounds and all the snacks that are next to it, like the fruit costs an extra pound or whatever, and you're like, you go into prep or another type of place, if you're like, it's going to cost me this number of pounds to buy what I consider a healthy lunch. And then in the place next door, you can buy a tastier, higher calorie um, lunch for sometimes half the price. It becomes harder and harder for individuals to make healthy choices over time. 
And that's why there's kind of arguments about individual willpower, because of course there are choices involved on an individual level. But on a larger level, there are many powers at play behind the scenes that make it harder for you to make those choices than you would have done 50 years ago. Also, capitalism in the sense that there are economies of scale. So when you've got a nation that are having, I don't know, 100,000 cans of Coke a day, your mm. production is cheaper. Your sourcing of aluminium, your logistics, your shipping, your freight, your transport, you've already got the trucks. They're already moving around the country. You've already got the vending machines, the vendors, all of these. So for you to put a can of Coke in a, in a school costs you nothing. And then the school are thinking, right, we don't have much revenue. If we put a vending machine in, we might make 10p a can. We could use that money to paint the nursery, whatever, I'm just speculating. So from every standpoint, the school needs the money because they're underfunded by the government. They put in the vending machine where they can get cans of Coke for very cheap, where they can get their pupils to come get it. And suddenly the can of Coke is, you know, back in my day it was 50p. 50p for a can of Coke, oh yeah. We're going to buy a burger for a pound. I'll get a can of Coke, 50p. And then this kind of creates that systemic issue where, like you say, these things are cheaper and more available. So then people start having more cans of Coke. Suddenly fruit is less in demand. People start eating less fruit. The people that are now producing fruit on farms and having, you know, all these costs go up and they can't ship a pack of apples from Leicestershire to London or whatever it is. So then their cost goes up and then suddenly the can of Coke versus the fruit, all of these things it makes it very, very difficult. And I completely agree about the environment thing you're saying. And I'm pretty sure, uh, I can't remember who it was. Maybe it was in Atomic Habits where they talk about the amount of soldiers that took opium in the Vietnam War. And they were worried they were going to have a pandemic on their hands when they came back of soldiers being addicted to opioids. But when they came back, the addiction rates were minimal. They were doing it to manage their stress. And they realized that they had a lot of people taking drugs that wouldn't usually take drugs because of the amount of stresses of war. But when they removed them from war and put them back into their home environments or into an environment that wasn't, you know, uh, benefited by these, barely any of them ever took opioids ever again, which is one of the most kind of addictive substances to go to show the environment is so important. I've often related looking at success, happiness, things we spoke about for yourself, moving from where you were living in the UK to somewhere else. I often refer to human beings as being like plants. Like there's a plant behind me. If I go and put that in the shade, it's fucked. Now, I can water it, I could sing to it, I could give it a hug every night before bed, but if it doesn't have the essential things it needs, again, like mental health, you need the sunlight, the soil, the water, all of those things. You neglect any of those things and you're fucked. And I do think there is an an environmental issue for humans at hand. And another thing here is we spoke about, you know, humans, habits, willpower. We seem to think that we're this divine intervention, that human beings are separate to animals, but the animal kingdom and us, we're, we're in it together. And anyone that's watched a an Attenborough documentary and there's like cheetahs or leopards in the wild and they've got two youngsters and or three youngsters and they go only two will survive the winter because there is not enough food to go around and you're like guys that that is the world the reason people used to have so many kids before was because not many of them would survive I think the average child rate maybe 100 200 years ago was four kids or something like that so much through evolution the scarcity has been that not even a whole litter of kids or animals or panthers or leopards would survive. That's how scarce it's been, polar bears, whatever it is. But we've now come to this agricultural revolution and you can't even fill up your car. You can't even, there's 5,000 hedonic, mass-produced, cheap offerings there that are going to feed your short-term cravings that you have, whether emotional, physiological, whatever. It is an increasingly uphill battle for people But it's like you say, there is no place to point and say this is the cause issue. And it is something where education is such an important part to play in people in such a nuanced topic. So I think uh, I think one of the the things that you point out is read. I love this as an example, and I've used it before, is when someone's struggling with their weight, it's very common to look at that individual and say, they lack willpower, they're lazy, whatever. But when the number of people that are struggling or feel like they're struggling with their weight grows, at some point you have to say, maybe it's not a willpower thing because the number of people struggling, something else is obviously going on. But if you step away from humans, for example, and if you swap it like you did with an animal, if you changed the animal's environment and they gained weight, you wouldn't blame the animal. So as an example of this, 
if you take rodents and put them in a cage and you change the diet that is available, you can reliably make them gain weight. And this is called a cafeteria diet. So if you give them a selection of high calorie, hyper palatable foods, the type of things you would get from a vending machine, chocolate bars, cookies, muffins, cakes, etc. If you make those more available to rodents, rodents will reliably gain weight and their genetics haven't changed but the environment has changed. And genetically, there might be reasons why some people find it easier to gain weight than others, like appetite signals, for example. But if you changed the food that rodents eat and you gave them way more of all of this super tasty, super high calorie stuff, and they start gaining weight, you don't blame the rodent and say that rodent's lazy, it lacks willpower. But that's kind of what's happening on a, on a human level is our food supply is changing. The cost of food are changing. The taste of foods are changing. The energy density and calorie values of food are changing. And when people gain weight, we still look at the person and say, it's their fault. They're lazy. And as an example, if we go back to maybe our second podcast, maybe first podcast, I remember you saying that you have a particular soft spot for almond croissants. Still do. Fuck. Still do. Um, so as an example, if you love this particular food, it can be really hard. If a personal trainer came along and said, from now on, you can't eat almond croissants, but you already love almond croissants. You know how they taste. You know, the mouth chasm that an almond croissant can give to you. It's very hard to take that away from someone that already knows how delicious it is. And the problem that we have now is that children are growing up with more of more exposure to these foods than we had when we were kids. And I use me as an example because I'm kind of quite an extreme example, at least in the Western world. I lived in such a tiny rural village when I grew up as a kid that we had we only had one really small shop. We didn't have a supermarket. We didn't have a pub. We didn't have a club. We didn't have anything. Um, we didn't have restaurants. And up until, I think probably over the age of 20, it would have been for me, uh, I personally didn't order a single food takeaway because there were no food takeaways that were delivered to our house because we were outside of the radius. So my mum, for example, she could order a takeaway and she could go and drive and pick it up. But it was rare because it was more, there was more friction to make that decision. It took more effort. And then when I, when I changed where I lived... And I lived somewhere where suddenly not only did we have food deliveries, but we had dozens of food deliveries available to us. And it's cheaper than ever and it's quicker to order than ever. And I can lie on the couch, watch Netflix, tap tap on my phone a few times, and 30 minutes later I've got a, an Indian takeaway. It becomes easier and easier to eat more because it takes less and less effort. And this is... Yeah, over time it becomes harder and I don't really know where it will stop because children today are going to find it harder than I would have done 30 years ago and I don't know what position we'll be in 20 years from now if the food um, food manufacturing direction continues as it is. Not to mention other things like financial implications of lockdowns, of inflation, of wars of all of these things even you know we've all kind of forgotten about the housing market bubble crash and the banks and all of this which has kind of sent a ripple through economic fuckery so the people are now having to work longer hours when they're getting paid by the hour or they're having to take a second job which means they have less time now they have less time to bring up their children so now they're around their children they're like fuck how can i appease my children oh i'll give them oh dad's here with the mcdonald's and they're they're doing what they think's right because they want to see their kids smile and they want to see them vibrant they want to see them happy because he's just finished a fucking 12-hour shift then you know they're having to wake up the kids when they should be sleeping because dad's got to go to work got to take you to nursery fuck i've got a very tired infant what can i do i'll put him in front of an ipad because that'll make him happy so now even the way that we bring up kids is being using these kind of tactics and distractions and i don't know a fucking thing about bringing up kids but i get worried about the amount of screen time they're getting and suddenly if kids are enjoying games at two, three years old and they're enjoying these hits of, you know, pleasurable chemicals in the brain and then we're using... I, My parents told me this since I was a child. I was a very loud baby, if you can't believe that, right? Very mouthy. They used to always give me a stick of French bread, even before I had full teeth, just to chew on and it would buy them a few hours of silence. Now, I could be connecting the dots here, but I emotionally and as far as an appetite thing, I seek comfort from food. I know wholeheartedly that I'm not hungry. I just want to eat because it makes me feel better. 
And like you say, I think the rates of that are only going to increase. And interestingly enough, I may have spoken about this before. I'll never forget one of my clients to talk about how nuanced fat loss is. She came to me and she was like, James, she actually sat in the console and went, I'm a fat fuck. Uh, you swear a lot. I think we're going to get on. So I said, okay, give me a food diary. And if you fucking lie, I will never work with you. And she was like, okay, that was it. That was the console. She came back and she gave me a food diary for the week. And she actually was one of my first clients who gave me the times of when she ate. She would wake up, she'd have some like biscuit, cereal biscuits in the UK, then she'd have a sandwich. But then between 12 and 6 p.m., she wouldn't eat. She's working. And then mm. she would binge. And her binges, when I next saw her, I said, well, this is pretty impressive, the amount of calories you're putting away. I said to her, are you willing to eat a second sandwich at 3 p.m.? I go, it's two more slices of bread. It's a little bit extra filling. Your food prep time is maybe 20% longer. Will you have a second sandwich at 3 p.m.? She said, why? I said, because I think you might eat less in the evenings because of it. She came back and her binges had reduced so much because in some respects, she was tripping herself up by trying to do six hours without food. And that was setting her up for a binge. So the counterintuitive nature of saying, I got my client eating an extra sandwich to put them in a deficit. Like these ways of thinking about things just aren't common or omnipresent with rational ideas about reducing calories because then people go, oh, so she ate more to lose weight. You're like, no. And this is why, again, I think education around this nuanced debate is so important for people to understand. Um, you said so much, uh, so much during that that I've got like three different topics I want to talk about and I can only remember one at a time. Um, the, the appetite regulation thing of telling your client to eat more to reduce what they ate later is brilliant and co purely coincidentally i posted about it about 30 minutes before this podcast for that exact reason where someone said it was like a response video and someone said by eating too little throughout the course of the day you find yourself eating more at night and how many people have like they're dieting they have a small breakfast they have a modest lunch they're exerting willpower to try and reduce their portion sizes and then when it comes to the evening evening they're fucking starving and they're at home they're tired from a long day of work their cupboards are full of all the tasty snack food and they eat the massive majority of their calories in the evening versus the morning and sometimes telling people to eat more can reduce the amount they're eating which is kind of um counterintuitive and i think that's an important um kind of take-home messaging take home message for dieting in general is if you tell people, okay, you need to just eat less, what actually happens in the real world isn't very straightforward. As you well know, if you if you told a hundred clients to go away and eat less, go and eat fewer calories, if you followed up with them and you had no other support for the next couple of months, you just said, eat less over the next two months, come back, a lot of those people wouldn't have lost weight because how they actually implement that advice is really tricky and they will all probably do something slightly different and some of them will starve themselves and then their appetite goes through the roof and then find themselves eating more or whatever but it's not as simple as just telling people to eat fewer calories and think that over the long term they're actually going to get any measurable success from that without giving them at least like an action plan of how they're going to implement it and what they're going to do we uh the calculator we have on the app we actually give people a, like a 10% deficit. It's not even 15. We, we actually made it a little bit more generous because putting the majority of people that want fat loss that close to maintenance, a lot of them are like, this is way too much. And then they eat what they consider to be way too much. And then they realize that across a week, even if they haven't lost weight or two weeks or three weeks, they suddenly feel like in control and they go, wow, I'm eating a lot and I'm not gaining weight. And then they start to get a basic understanding of the thing we've just spoken about, that they can eat quite a lot of food and that it does reduce the, the binges. And the binges are such an emotional trauma. And I know because I used to binge a lot as a child. I used to sneak around the house at midnight to go get massive family packs of chocolate and eat it. I would even hide the wrappers in my sister's room sometimes. So then, uh, <laughs> true story. <laughs> but then we bury those emotions and those memories we actually disregard them from our memory and we we physically misreport on it where we like know that that massive bag of family pack of crisps at one in the morning that that didn't happen so when we give people this larger amount of calories like you say it actually helps them relax and funnily enough 30 minutes before this podcast i didn't see your post because i was messaging Darren. i said to the the lads luke as well i go lads i'm eating whatever the fuck i want 
last night, every night I'm having dessert, I'm having ice creams. I even, just randomly, what day was it yesterday? Tuesday night. I was like, I'm having a beer with dinner. Just had a beer. Popped a bottle of Corona. I barely drink these days. I'm like, I'm having a beer. Woke up this morning, 92.4 kilograms. I'm lighter than Duran. And I said to them, either this balance of training a lot and eating what I want is working for me, or I've got a chronic disease and illness and I'm probably going to die soon. But being stress-free is actually... <laughs> Fingers crossed it's not the second one. <laughs> that, that ability to relax and to eat normally and not tell myself to restrain has definitely helped me. And following, I've written myself a new training program and I said to myself, the first month, you're just going to be getting used to the exercises and the movements. You're going to have a lot of soreness. I've given myself split squats and all of these things that are evil. I was like, James, just eat what you want. And if you're fat, come the end of it, we'll call it a bulk. And then we can start to rein in your diet a bit. But it's crazy what you say there about telling people that they can eat more has such a profound impact on allowing people to then eat less. So this is actually kind of one of the basic backbone arguments for why, for some people at least, it might be more sensible not to focus on dieting, but to focus on healthy habits and the backbone behind uh, intuitive eating rather than intentional weight loss efforts. Because if if we use the easy example, if you told 100 people to go away and lose weight without giving them any further guidance on how to implement it, you would probably notice that some of them find themselves in a really bad place. Some of them will avoid their favorite foods. Some of them will completely cut out carbohydrates. Some of them will try not to eat after 6 p.m. Like All the things they see on social media being scattered around. And a lot of them will fuck up their relationship with food because they're being told by some shit staying on social media that if, if they eat carbs after 6 p.m., they'll get fat. And that restriction can often rebound to the point where they find themselves eating more over the course of the day or over the course of several weeks where they're dieting, but they're dieting so aggressively that at weekends they find themselves eating more food and they're robbing from one hand to give to the other. And sometimes, like you have alluded to, taking a step back and being more relaxed by taking away that initial restriction, you can also remove some of the compensatory rebounds that some people get. And I kind of describe it as aggressive like really aggressive dietary rules for some people can feel like you're putting an animal in a cage and the more strict the rules are the smaller the cage is and it's natural for that animal to want to get out so if i said to you you listening to this podcast okay from now on here's a long list of foods you're not allowed to eat all of your favorite foods you can't eat those they're not diet conducive a lot of people would avoid those foods only for a week or so before they get so fucking hungry they really want the food that they're avoiding and all of a sudden they eat more than they did before the cheap meal mentality that i know both of us have talked about a lot and sometimes by giving themselves permission to eat the food that they're avoiding they remove that temptation to then binge on it later in which case you could say maybe it's worth not being so restrictive in the first place and it's important to balance how restrictive someone's being to make sure that it doesn't bite them in the arse later. So yeah, exactly what you say there. The cage thing's great. I, I used to have that even with working hours. I hated having a job where they told me when I could work because my productivity comes at different times of the day. I don't want to sit down and conform, oh, you must take lunch between now and then, let alone with the diet side of things. And interestingly enough, even though I was given the name, the calorie deficit guy, I actually sell training programs and the majority mm. of my online training is actually a training program. And we give people the calories, but they don't get really scored on how well they're in a deficit. The majority of people, we use the calorie calculator, lure, the, lure them in, they see the app, they're like, oh, this looks good. They can see member testimonials. But we give someone a training program, we make it theirs. We're like, this is yours. Whether you're training at home or you're in the gym, whatever it is, now improve on that. And they might start tracking here loosely, start eating a bit better, but it's so much of the mentality of where they now go, wow, I have a program. I've paid for something. I've got skin in the game. I'm improving. And then their squat gets a bit better. The soreness gets a little bit less intense. All of these things. And you almost take it from a psychological, uh, nutritional intake kind of realm. And you take them into the training world. And once you get someone just that little bit better trained, suddenly it's the training focus that gets their habits to improve. They go, well, 
I, should, I wouldn't have spent an hour in the gym and walked like John Wayne for two days to come home and eat an Indian takeaway. They'll be like, no, nah, come on, let's, let's eat something proper. And I think that's something that a lot of people have misinterpreted where people are like so into, they're like, oh, you must fast. You can't eat till 1 p.m. You can't have carbs. You can't have, you know, seed oils, grains. Everyone's like, bum, 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 with all of this. And everyone, like you say, their cages are getting smaller, smaller, smaller. But instead, we should say to people like, yo, how's your training going? Oh, uh, are you, are you following a structure? Do you even know you're getting stronger? Do you even know you're getting fitter? No, not really. Give them the tools to start in that realm and so much of the rest will come. Same when I see people stand still in escalators. I'm like, you motherfuckers. I'm like, some of you pay hundreds of fucking dollars for a training program and you stand still in escalators. I'm like, come on, there's an identity change that needs to occur. And I think the identity change is easier to change in the gym than it is in the kitchen. Do you know what I think is a really important message is when you said that you don't put people into an aggressive calorie deficit when they start with the app, I bet a lot of people push back on that. I bet you get loads of messages from people saying, you're telling me to eat too much food. I need to eat less if I want to lose fat. Is that right? Yeah, all the time. And Uh, they're like, this seems high and that's when I lose it. Um, But you know, and I know, and most people know when they actually step back and think about it. How many people start a diet in January, January the 1st or 2nd because they're hungover on the 1st and they follow a really strict fucking juice cleanse, intermittent fasting, keto hybrid and four weeks later they've lost the will to live and they just go back to what they're doing before and they've gone in so aggressive, they've gone head, they've dived in head first into this super aggressive diet plan that they can't sustain it and then they jump off that wagon and just go back to what they're doing before it's very binary it's either on or off i'm either dieting or i'm not dieting and what you're saying is rather than going metaphorically balls deep or head first into a dieting plan why don't we just make one little adjustment why don't we focus on training we're not going to give you the most aggressive training plan in the world because you don't want to walk like John Wayne for the next week and you can't uh, continue with your training program. We'll start gentle. Do a shorter workout. Do a lighter workout. And over time, it's easier to build up than it is, for a lot of people at least, to throw them in at the deep end and expect them to swim. And if someone starts with a gentle training program or a gentle dietary adjustment, after a couple of weeks or after a month, when they feel like they've accomplished that, they're often in a position where they can build on it. And what you are saying, even if you're not saying it on your app, and what I am saying, is for a lot of people adding small dietary adjustments or small training adjustments, although it seems very gradual, really, really gradual, sometimes too gradual for the naked eye to see, what you're saying is in a year you will actually be in a better place, a much better place. In two years you'll have you'll be in a much better place, you'll have better habits. Whereas if you go in head first into something really extreme, if you can't stick with it longer than four weeks, all you're doing is going back to square one over and over again. You're going forward to square 10 of snakes and ladders, and then you're going straight back to square one. And we're just saying, go gentle. Try and, if you if you have a goal that is going to take years, if you have a goal of improving your health for the rest of your life or maintaining your weight or regulating your weight for the rest of your life, it doesn't make sense to embark on habits that you can only sustain for weeks. And that's why I think starting off with your gentle, here's how we're going to ease into the program, whilst a lot of people might push back because it's not extreme enough for the expectations they've learnt off social media, what you're doing is saying, we're going to ease in gently, going to hold your hand, dip a toe in the water, then you can put a foot in later if you want. I did hundreds, maybe even like a thousand consult PT sessions where I'd have a brand new person come in and I could after a while I was saying you become like a almost like an inspector like what was the who's the famous character Robert Downey Jr Sherlock Holmes Sherlock yeah people came in I'd look at that because I was on the gym floor for like four years I was doing like 40 hour weeks I could tell where someone I was in Bracknell by the shoes the leggings and the top I could tell which area you've come from this person yeah he's from that part of Bracknell this person he's He's here working in the technology park. He's not from around here. I've seen his BMW outside. I've seen the three series. He's not local. He's working in the technology park. But just by the way they walk and they came in, I was like, this person's at a desk, whatever. But when people came in, some of them I knew were strong enough to deadlift 30 kilograms. And I used to, I used to keep my little five kilogram bumper plates in the PT room because I didn't want the other trainers using them, bastards. Yeah. 
But my job when they came in wasn't to get them to deadlift 30 kilograms. It was to prove to them they could do it. And that is such a big difference. And it's the same thing with dieting. I don't need to... You can do something. My job for the next hour, which is going to lock me in to get a fucking 12 block of PT session sold to you. Don't you worry about that. You're not leaving without signing this bit of paper. But I would get them. I'd come in. I'd give them a broomstick handle. They're like, I'm, I'm paying you to train. I'm like, no, no, no. Before we get that, let me let me prove to you can do this. To so get the broomstick, I teach them the hip hinge. They do the hip hinge. I was like, cool. You can bend over. No problem in your back. Cool. Loading your hamstrings. Sweet. Get the kettlebell over. They're like, what am I doing with this? I'm like, you're just standing up. They stand up. Eight kilogram kettlebell. Cool. Now touch the invisible button with your bum. Come down. Cool. And I'm sweating. I'm running around. I'm like, cool. 12 kilograms. Cool. 15 kilograms. Cool. 20 kilogram kettlebell. Can you do that for 10 reps? Cool. Sweet. We're ready. I take them to the barbell. They're like, oh, it's intimidating. I'm in a squat rack. I'm like, you can do this because I've just seen you go through all the stages before. And if anyone had walked in before and seen the four kilogram kettlebell or the broomstick, they would not have thought anything impressive was going on. But then when I get them there and I say to them, you've done all the steps necessary, you can lift this. And they lift it and they give me a little look. I'm like, don't look at me, keep looking forward. And they go down. So much of what we do within the education space is just getting the narrative inside someone's head to say, from I can't do this to I can do this. And that is such an important thing that people need to appreciate in their dieting because it's very easy for me to give you rigid rules and for very soon on that, especially in a severe deficit where you get good results in your week one, that voice that you can't do it very quickly comes along. Yeah, I think it's I think it's a really good point and I think it's really important to say that making people feel more confident with something is like easier to build on. And it's kind of like, you could view it as riding a bike. When you get a child to ride a bike, you start off with stabilizers or you start off with a parent or guardian kind of holding them up. Once they get used to pedaling, you can kind of slowly move away, slowly move away, take your hands off. But you've given them the confidence to start with something. Then you've made it a little bit harder and a little bit harder and a little bit harder. And you have that gradual progression until they're riding a bike on their own versus getting a child putting on a bike straight away and just watching it continuously topple over not being able to pick up the momentum to the majority of fads in the fitness industry be like chucking someone on a skateboard right i've given a couple skateboard lessons in my time lean forward lean forward lean forward and they're like why i'm like because everyone falls off backwards on a skateboard that is the biggest way that people fall off right they fall off backwards the skateboard flies forward and they crack their head on the floor and then do you know what they do they never get on a skateboard again and i say to people if you lean forward and you fall off, what happens? You put the other leg out, the skateboard goes flying backwards, Catch or at least you can land on your hands and knees. Yeah. And I'm like, you know, like something so little, but so many people, like you say, no stabilizers, no help. They just dive in. I'm going keto. I'm no longer going to eat before 1 p.m. I'm no longer eating carbohydrates. I'm going vegan. All of these things. People don't realize the, the, the huge steps they're taking they've, and how daft it is. And one thing I like is how different our approaches are on social media for this. Your TikTok's getting a lot of traction. You're becoming a very popular person on there. Your Instagram's doing really well as well. I almost have to get people to hate me a little bit in the beginning just so they'll listen. You get people to love you so they'll listen. <laughs> I'd like to know if you have any tips. Okay, you've got that sensitive side you've been bringing out. I've seen it. I've seen uh, it. Yeah, but you know what like we have very different approaches to social media like our personalities in some ways our content is really similar and in some ways it's not similar at all i occasionally um uh i've occasionally seen people giving you shit saying all he does is preach a calorie deficit it's not that simple and i'm like that's not all he does he's preaching a calorie deficit to attack the charlatans that are trying to sell them something else but you're not telling all of your clients and all of your app members just to go on a calorie deficit you're giving them the tools and it's actually a very methodical way of putting people into a better place and i think people view it as the way we're approaching things is is very different but most of the things that we believe are are very shared we just have different communication styles um you're i mean i feel like you have grown on social media faster than any fitness person that i know of and how many people can say, oh, yeah, I grew X million followers in like five years or whatever. In the, This is our third podcast. In this time, since our first podcast, you have had three Sunday Times bestsellers. And yeah, you, but- you've, you've, I think you've, your way of making a name for yourself has been very, very effective. And it's easy for me to come in and be nice and be polite. But 
I am a very slow burner. I've been on social media for like over a decade, and I probably have a fraction of the followers that you do. I think you're doing a good job. You're allowed. To, you're allowed to. I think you're allowed to go in and ruffle some feathers if you have good intentions of helping people in the long run. Yeah, and you know what? I do get a bit of hate, but the thing is, my come up in the first few years was just from doing the exact same thing. I was poking poking people all around the internet, so I take it. But one thing that I, I would be keen to. I think I'm struggling, right, with the hedonic treadmill. And I, this is one thing that I probably struggled with this year. As soon as I accomplish something, I'm numb to it so quick, right? The, and this sounds really bitter to say. The Looking back in retrospect, the three bestsellers, the, the visa, I'm kind of like, okay, cool, what's next? And I really struggle with that. And sometimes I think with the following thing, or the followers... There's definitely that I want to help people. There's definitely that I want to do things. But then sometimes I think I'm just looking for the next target. I think if I was a dog, I'd be a working breed. I think that's why I got a Kelpie. I'd need to be a cattle dog or something. I need a job to do, but I struggle to enjoy it. After I stress up until the point I've done it. And then when I've done it, I can't enjoy it. But like you say, you didn't celebrate the book, right? Correct, yeah. Correct. I, I, I went for one very cheap dinner with the wife. And basically that was like a, I've been a bit of a shit husband for the past few months because I've been a bit distracted. Even when I'm there, I'm a bit distracted because I've always had something going on. And I said, it'd be really nice if we just went for a quiet dinner. And then we went and got Asian food in this kind of cheap restaurant. And it was a really nice way to celebrate. And if I said to someone, I now have a best-selling book and they asked me how I'd celebrate, that would sound very anticlimactic. But at the time it was perfect. I think the thing that, you, the thing that you've said there, I like I love this conversation because... I used a similar example in the first chapter. I think it's actually the first citation of the whole book. And it's from a reference paper called Explaining Happiness. And they talk about how people recalibrate <laughs> they talk about how people recalibrate their happiness over time. So if you get a pay rise at work, you celebrate, yay, let's go out for drinks, I've got a ten percent pay rise. But for a lot of people, that ten percent pay rise, and this goes back to our pleasure happiness thing that you talked about before that the happiness from that pay rise is kind of short-lived because they next they chase the next pay rise and the pay rise after that. And I think it's applicable to loads of things. So in the dieting world, how many guys, and I'll use guys as an example because we're two guys talking, but obviously the same applies for, for girls as well. How many guys uh, think they're going to be happy if they lose a couple of pounds? You know, if I had a if I had a visible four-pack, I'd be happy. If I had a little bit more tone in my biceps, I'd be happy. And then they get to that point and they don't go, oh, I actually achieved the goal I was setting out to. Awesome, I'm happy now. They go, well, actually, maybe a six-pack, That I think that would make a difference. Maybe if I had bigger biceps, that would be better. And they recalibrate what their goal is, and they recalibrate what they think it's going to take to make them happy. And it's very easy to kind of get on this spiral of uh, chasing satisfaction and never really getting to the point of satisfaction. And I think... Most creators on social media, if I'm being honest, probably know this because most creators on social media, massive generalization, but I think people will understand it. They start on social media because they've got something to say. They're just posting on social media willy nilly. They see their follow account growing and suddenly they have goals. It'd be really nice if I got 50,000 followers. How amazing would that be? But when someone hits 50,000 followers, how many of those people immediately think, do you think I could hit 75? Do you think I could hit 100,000? And you get to the point where it's like the next goal, the next goal, the next goal. And I'm not a psychologist. I don't know what uh, how this should be navigated. But I think it's important to realize that a lot of people are chasing the goal that is always one step ahead. It's like running and you've got a carrot on the stick. And it doesn't matter how far you run. It doesn't matter how fast you run. The carrot is always going to be two steps ahead. And people are chasing the carrot of happiness and they spend their whole life chasing and they never get the carrot. And I think it's really good from an ambition perspective. Like you've accomplished more in your years on the planet than most people have in theirs. Like objectively in terms of like career accomplishments, what you've done is incredible. And part of the reason I think that you're so, um, that you've achieved that is because you're so ambitious and it's hard kind of reconciling ambition without 
having that psychology of you can never pause to appreciate what you've got because if you paused after book one you wouldn't have written book two if you paused after book two you wouldn't have written book three like you're riding the wave and you're immediately going on to the next thing and that's why you've done so well thank you that's very kind words you know i found this earlier uh, this is me celebrating six thousand followers uh, is that 2017 ago. is it 20 yeah yeah so i was like and back then six thousand followers i was like i fucking made it i was like i'm famous and looking back at that now, I was probably happier hitting 6,000 than I was hitting a million. And at that point as well, a few months before, this is one thing, one lesson that I'd love to, for everyone to hear, that all wins feel the same. So the chemicals in my brain don't give me an Uber surcharge because, you know, let's say, rewind six years, if I got a bunk bed on the East Coast, let's say I've got a, a 10-hour bus journey. I'm going from somewhere in Australia to somewhere else. Do you know what I'm thinking about the whole time? getting a bottom bunk. That's all I'm thinking about, Ben. Getting a bottom bunk at the hostel. There's 14 people in a room and I'll be damned if I'm getting a top bunk. Because if you get a bottom bunk, you get to wedge your towel in up against the mattress above and you've got your own private room, pretty much. If there's a towel dangling down, mate, I've got a private room. I get in there, I get a bottom bunk. I'm like, fucking get in, right? That's literally what it's like. Nowadays, R. James, um, you know, Stephen Bartlett's nominated one of your books, so it's in every WH Smith in the UK uh, as his recommendation. Oh, that's cool. I'm like, where's the guy who was celebrating a bottom bunk? Where's he gone, Ben? Because how? But the thing is that these emotions of happiness are the same at every level. So when you said before, let's say that everyone in their fat loss is like, oh, I wouldn't mind getting a four pack, then a six pack. I wouldn't mind losing the kilogram. People need to appreciate that every stage in that journey is going to feel the same. But then every stage in that journey is going to get to the point where you're, you're bored of it, you're dull of it. Anyone out there, if you're working towards a marathon, you need to be ready for that fucking ultra Ironman that's coming because it won't stop. You will become numb or it won't be fast enough or you didn't do it well enough or your strategy wasn't good enough. I actually think that we don't talk enough about how fucked the majority of us are when it comes to goal setting and... We, we seem to be, oh, I certainly beat myself up about the numbness. We need to have something to work for. And I actually think that people out there that don't have a training regime or something to work towards, like you say, you were alluding to health at every size, and I appreciate that. And we should, in many respects, get people to get onto this treadmill. And one thing that's helped a lot of my clients is getting them into jiu-jitsu, where every, when you've got someone suffocating you with chest sweat on your face at 7 a.m. in the morning, you haven't got any other problems in life. And you're just thinking about, how can I get better at this? How can I improve? You get a stripe on your belt and soon it becomes numb, then it's four stripe, then you're a blue belt, then you're a purple belt, whatever. We need to have this hierarchical treadmill that we climb up. And I actually think many people are in despair because they don't know where the next goalpost is. So the only way to feel happiness or to uh, relish in the moment is to do it through gluttony. What are your thoughts? Uh, there's, a, there's a lot to a lot to unpack with that i think i think one of the things that you said were like pe people need a goal so one of the things that i noticed is with book writing um i i felt happier having a goal so when i started book writing it was a it was petrifying it's like such a it's such a huge project and when i hit publish it was a weight off my chest but i think working towards something actually made me happier because it feel, felt like I had purpose. And you've talked about this before. Um, I think book two, um, not a life coach, and or, or at least around book two. Um, and I'm going to be talking to me in our last podcast about being aimless. And I think when, for example, when I was going through a period of depression, I think one of the things that was hard for me is it didn't feel like I had a purpose. I was doing the same job that I enjoyed and I was living the same life and there was nothing wrong with it, but I didn't have anything big. I didn't have anything real kind of exciting me. I didn't have anything that lit a fire in me and made me get out of bed in the morning, like excited to attack the day. And book writing actually did that for me. I would often wake up and think, I know what chapter I'm starting today, or I know what my task is for the day. And having a little bit more sense of purpose actually made me feel a lot happier, it gave me more of an idea of what I was doing with myself. It made me feel less aimless. And I think having that goal was 
really beneficial for me and i think it's been really good from a mental health perspective um i don't know how to i don't know where the balance is between appreciating what i've done and doing what you do when you're like what what next if i want if i want to be as successful as you are i now need to think what next and I don't actually know how healthy that is. I don't know where the balance is between pausing and going, you know what, I've, what I've done is really amazing. I should appreciate that. And immediately going on and saying, what shall I do next? What can I do next? I'm going to give you the advice that I need to hear myself. You need Great. to swap comparison for progressive overload. Yeah. And that's what I need to be told. Because whatever... What are you comparing to? I get to. I, it's so easy to access people doing it way better. Oh, I might do a bit better with the podcast, get the episodes out a bit more frequently. Oh, Joe Rogan's doing five a week. Fuck. You know, oh, it'd be nice to pay off my parents' mortgage. You know, Logan Paul just did 45 million in a month with Prime. And then suddenly you're like, you get overwhelmed with all of these things and you go, right, relax. Let's take stock of where I'm at. What's my bench? What's my chin-ups? What's my, what's this? Cool. How's my business performing? What are we doing this quarter? What are we looking at next? And mm. I get to determine what the next rung or the next progression looks like. In weights, we have kilograms. If you lift in pounds, you're lost. Do they use pounds in America? Unfortunately. That's why I'll never live there. Yeah. Then you've got, you know, progressions. Uh, it was a hard sell for me. Progressions in book sales, progressions, all those things. And I think the kind of really important lesson for people listening is that you get to determine what that progression looks like, but it's so important you don't use comparison for that because comparison almost like creates a disheartened version it, it it's disintegrating to your ambition i am um, we've both talked about this a lot like comparison being the thief of joy and whenever i've talked about this i've never made it sound like that's the only thing that comparison does because if we rewind four years or five years or whatever i was a personal trainer working in a gym do you know one of the, one of the things that changed my life, and I know we'll talk about it at some point, but was IFS. And IFS was being surrounded by people who were doing more in the industry that I had already spent my whole adult life in. And I didn't view it as, I don't view it as a negative thing. I don't view it as, oh my God, they're doing so much more than me. I feel shit by comparison. It was almost like they were illuminating the road that I didn't even realize existed. So you, for example, um, I think we, we probably started talking online like five years ago or whatever. You shared my does eating bread make you gain weight infographic, um, humble times. And I because I became friends with you and I saw what you were doing, to me, I saw that as amazing. And it actually blew my mind that a personal trainer could come from nothing in terms of you've just started in the industry, you're working your way up from Fitness First in Sydney, you're starting building on social media. You were at the bottom of the ladder in the fitness world in terms of your entry. You didn't go in as a millionaire, you know, inheriting a, a fortune. And you became the fastest growing person that I knew with the most success in terms of books out of anyone that I, I knew. And I didn't view that, I didn't have that comparison as like the thief of joy. It was, holy shit, look what can be achieved if you know what you're doing. And I think it's, I think it's really important to, to realize when you're looking at something else and being hard on yourself and making yourself feel worse because you're robbing your own joy. But you can also look at other people as a source of comparison, uh, as a source of inspiration which is what I think I did with you and what I think I do with um, a lot of other people. And I think maybe the, the hard thing for me, the reason I'm probably hard on myself is because I'm comparing myself to where I think I should be, not necessarily comparing it to other people and going, I'm not doing enough. It's what I think I could have done, what I think my potential is versus what I've achieved. And I think that's maybe one of the reasons I'm harder on myself. The inspiration thing is really important because... I think it's very important that people look to other people's success. And this is, I, I, I came up with the, an, a kind of theory on this. I called it the hater inspiration paradox. I didn't put it in the book. When you look at someone's success, you're taking down two four? paths, inspiration or hatred. Yeah. And a lot of people don't want to be inspired because it shows them the amount of work they're going to need to do to get there. State Joe Rogan is an example. 
you've got a podcaster. You want to be a big podcaster, yeah. Cool. Do four episodes a week for 10 years, then come back. People don't want to do it. They don't want to be inspired by that because it looks like too much work. So what do they do? Oh, he's a, yeah, he's a, he's a prick. I don't like him or whatever. So the inspiration thing is massive because people do need to seek inspiration. Like behind any person struggling with their weight or their health or whatever, they should look at other people and go, that's possible. But there's like that success leaves clues kind of breadcrumbs thing. And I mean, it's, it's weird for me to, to kind of hear that. It, it's kind of like everything that I've experienced in my life is kind of quite weird. But one thing that I think is important for us to do, especially in other people, sometimes you've got to just remove yourself from that world. And like, if you're in a happy, loving relationship, sometimes I just think, I'm just going to build like a, a nuclear bun- bunker with a year's worth of food. And if this all goes to shit, I could just retreat to that with my dog and my missus, you know? Put in Call of Duty, put it in a PlayStation in there. And that's all you need. But these mechanisms that we're talking about for inspiration, for confidence, for like succeeding everywhere, people need to appreciate these are in every single realm of our life. And kind of the same mentality that you apply to one, you can apply to all. And it is an interesting discussion to have. This is why I love chatting to you. We've gone an hour and a quarter without any show notes. Like, <laughs> what What's on the agenda for Ben Carpenter next? And I'm, you're coming to IFS uh, this year. I keep forgetting what year it is. Uh, in Brighton. Obviously. It's, it's literally the only thing I have in my diary. I have nothing else in my diary. The thing, like, you know it's like, until you get your visa, you don't know what your schedule is. Six months from now... Am I allowed to live in Australia? This is you. Am I allowed to live in Australia? Am I still traveling? And you will pencil in dates that you know you'll make work like you were doing your tour dates. But until you know where you're living, it's kind of hard to build a a backbone on that. And I haven't really got to the point where I'm doing anything in my diary. I've spent so long kind of book writing that my my diary was just a a big blur. Do that occasionally, do do a podcast, occasionally see friends. Uh, IFS is the only thing I've got in my diary. And my wedding. <laughs> <laughs> IFS is the only thing I'm traveling for in my diary, like events-wise. So uh, I'm very much looking forward to that. I'm looking forward to seeing you there. We'll have a mojito. There, there are time, when I wrote my first book, you were there sending mojitos to my hotel. So I'm there. Yeah. I've, I've gone to escape my life. I've gone to Barcelona to put myself in a hotel so I get book writing done. And there's a little knock at the door. I'm like, hello, come in. They're like, two mojitos are here for you, sir. I was like, who the hell? And then I knew it was you. So Ben, what did, didn't you find it like, it just helps the book writing process. Uh, the creative mind. PM. It was 10 PM in bed. I chinned him and went to sleep. <laughs> I, tried, I didn't want to drink, but I didn't want him to go to waste. Um, I just, I have this thing, always be the first person to buy a round. If it's with a mate, buy a round first. I like it. I like it. And I'll make sure I bring him in Brighton. I want you to, this is your opportunity now. This is your, your hard sell. I'm sorry we didn't talk about more in the book, but you know what? I didn't want to talk about the book. I want to talk about you. Because I think ultimately, if people can understand who you are, they'll know why you, you've written a book. But you should have some form of media training to someone's on the fence, 50 50. Oh, yeah, it's a book. Tell them why they should buy it. Uh, I actually, firstly, I love that we haven't talked more about the book versus just chatting. Because I think if I if we'd done a podcast just talking about my book, people would be like, this is a sales pitch, it's, it's annoying. Whereas if we give value to the listener, people like you and they like me. That's good for both of us, and I'm kind of happy with that. Um, I don't I don't have a hard sales pitch for the book. I have no kind of media training. What I would say is if anyone's interested, I wrote the book to be kind of like a definitive guide. It's like a resource. You can go into every chapter and go from zero to hero level knowledge by finding out the science in an unbiased fashion. Every chapter you can dip into like a a resource. If you want the science on meal frequency, you want to know the science on a specific diet or macronutrients or whatever. Each section has a lot of science in and it's presented in a way so you can make decisions for yourself. That was a good sales pitch. This is my next thousand TikToks. I, I I honestly wrote it. So I wrote this as like a... It was Luke who said this to me, actually. He said, if you write a book... You write a leg. It's a legacy project. It's a labor of love. And I went into it thinking this is probably or possibly the only book I'll ever write. And if I die tomorrow and someone's like, I want all the information on fat loss. 
they don't have to go through my social media they can just go here's the book and it's every topic it's not a quick read you don't sit and take a shit and skim through a chapter like it's fucking long it's 106,000 words um but if you want something that's kind of if you enjoy all-encompassing science this is i wrote it as the book for those of you watching on youtube i'll put the links in the description where you can get a copy of the book and even if you're not going to read it just buy it you know just buy it show your love to ben you know flying isn't cheap these days and the 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 poor guy he's coming over to the uk for ifs uh every copy they buy my royalty is probably that of a cheap mojito in Brighton. So they're inadvertently <laughs> fueling us sharing mojitos when we reunite next. Yeah, fantastic. Uh, we need to do this more often. Ben, thank you so much for coming on. Uh, as always, an effortless conversation to be had. Uh, I very much appreciate you. If people want to find you on socials, where should they go? BDC Carpenter is fine. Same on Instagram, same on TikTok. There, his initials followed by his old job. I, I um, saw your, what you shared on that, yeah. My dad was thank, a carpenter, fact. <laughs> thank you very much for coming on. It's been a thank you very much for having me.